You have the opportunity to make an opening statement for five minutes. We will keep you closely to time. Um, we are happy at a later stage to take written evidence from you if you want to elaborate on anything. And then we will take questions from the panel. And we're more than happy for you to decide who wishes to field which questions as we go along. So I'm not sure which of you will, will make the statement. but. Um, I'm going to speak on behalf um, of ourselves, um, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, panel members. Um, my colleagues and I welcome this opportunity to contribute to this very important inquiry. A bit so. closer to you, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> Is that better? Um, <clears throat> I mean, we want to make the situation better for our patients and our staff um, in partnership with our management colleagues and other clinical colleagues from uh, across the different services. We feel that it's important to recognise that ED has been the focus of a lot of media attention over the past number of months, um, not always for positive reasons and not always for reasons that we would want to be in the media. I think it's important as well that we formally acknowledge the hard work, dedication and resilience of our staff who work in the Belfast Trust emergency departments. Staff who come in to work endeavour to deliver the best care possible to each and every patient. However, this is often very difficult due to the stressful environment in which they're working in, which can be busy, frenetic, um, and this can compromise patient care on occasions. So thank you for giving us this opportunity to come and contribute to this inquiry. Okay. Okay, well, perhaps I could ask the first question, which is, <coughs> The difficulties in, in accident emergency in the Royal were, as you said, um, fairly well documented. I wonder if you could tell us what you think the underlying causes of the problems were, um, and whether you think now that we've had an RQIA inspection and a, um, uh, an improvement plan, whether things are now different from where they were at the time when the inspection took place, and if so, how they are different. So two parts really. The first is what do you think are the underlying problems that caused the difficulties in, in the Royal in the first place? Um, I'm happy to, to start and then I'm sure uh, John and Nick will, will um, um, proceed after me. I think the, the biggest challenge for us working in the emergency department, um, we're part of a system and if there's issues with regards to how the system and patients move through that system as compromised, well then it, it's manifested in the emergency department. If patients come in and there's a decision to admit but there's no bed for that patient to go to, then that patient rem remains in the emergency department until such times as a bed is available. Um, sometimes as well the emergency department is used as access um, to other hospital services. So if a patient needs a diagnostic or if a patient needs a specialty review, um, these patients also come to the emergency department. So it's a systems problem, but it's how the, the problems are manifested because um, if patients can't be moved on elsewhere, then they remain in the emergency department, which becomes overcrowded and congested. Um, I, I suppose I would uh, reiterate what has been said uh, within the emergency department. Uh, world as well as here in Northern Ireland, overcrowding or crowding of your emergency department is a big issue facing emergency departments everywhere. Um, I recently returned to Australia uh, two months ago and they had exactly the same problems as, as you have here. We could, we could be doing exactly the same panel uh, for, for Australian emergency departments. Um, but it is the biggest problem we would have, I think, the problem that led to is the
it was not a problem of suddenly came out of the blue. Um, and therefore, I wonder how have we managed to have a situation where this, where the numbers have not changed significantly, but the pressures have remained for a very, you know, a number of years until we reached a kind of pitch which almost forced everybody to to look at what was going on. Your mics, I think we're having trouble probably with mine too. So can you kind of move forward when you're when you're answering? Sorry. I'm not Sorry. sure you can get your mic any nearer, but um, the other question I'd like uh, to ask then is we know that there are um, the second part of the question was that Belfast has trust has a, a, an improvement plan in place. Has that made a difference? And if so, in what way? I think you're sorry, I'm sorry about that. Um, following our QIA, there was a lot more engagement with our management colleagues. And I think, as was said yesterday, probably for the first time in a long time, staff felt that they were being listened to. Um, so there was a lot of support mechanisms put in place for staff um, following that. And we did get additional nursing resource, um, which has helped. But that's only part of the solution, um, having more nursing staff is only part of the solution. The thing that will um, improve the situation will be about the, sorting the system um, and relieving the congestion in the emergency department. Um, I mean, there's we've been extremely busy even over the summer months. I mean, I've worked in emergency care a long time, and I've never known it to be as busy as this over the summer months. Um, and we're still faced with the issues of, of crowding. Um, that has to be part of the whole system to resolve that. It's not only up to the emergency department clinicians to, to resolve that. Um, everybody along the system, from the, the time the patients admit it right through to community services, all have to be part of this. Clinicians are, are, are given much more of a, a almost an autonomy to to, uh, to take particular actions. Can you give an example of where that's happened, which wouldn't have happened, let's say, a year ago or two years ago? I absolutely can. Just, just up, even up yesterday morning, I had access to a full board of German chief executive where we discussed exactly the group of the clinicians, senior clinicians, saying this is where we want to go. These are our plans. This is where we. This is where we want to be. 
and there's definitely an employment of us. So this is definitely actively ongoing uh, since I have returned to the trust. Okay. My final question before I hand on to, to Marion is, um, so one we asked yesterday, which is, if, and I ask it to all three of you, if there were two things that you could do immediately that would make things better in terms of the, the systems issues that you've talked about, what would they be and why? The first one for me, try and get the patients out of the emergency department to the correct place that they be, to the correct, especially the right patient in the right place. And that would certainly make the work of the emergency department I would say that I would want every single patient who comes through our doors and their families to have the experience that they want to have um, and in order to support that um, I would want staff to have time to spend with patients and families um, so those are the two things that I would want and ultimately they can only be achieved if we reduce the, the congestion and the overcrowding. Absolutely. I would agree. The one thing that would make a massive change the one thing that would make a massive change would be to actually have flow through the department. If we achieve that it gives us the time and also the space to make sure that each individual patient gets the care that they deserve. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Pass you to Marion. Good morning, Good morning. Good morning. Elderly patients with dementia or those with communication difficulties, how do you feel they experience emergency care and what suggestions do you have that would improve the experience of such individuals when they go to emergency departments? Uh, go. Yeah, and then I can t- with communication oh. <laughs> um, uh, he's, it, it, it's very difficult for him to communicate what his needs are and what his wants are uh, and equally as a doctor I recognise how difficult it then is to uh, interpret what, what needs to be done and, and what has to be done um, in terms of how we improve it I think the education of people and education of doctors uh, knowing about specific needs and difficulties it's you can understand it when you have someone that you know, when you're you're aware of someone who's like that and you know what they're like but i think educating and community and knowing how families feel maybe better integration and we do have specific uh, you know policies that we, we we have we look at and are there but maybe getting them out to staff and staff understanding them and communicating them to a wider staff and um, again with these groups difficulties come down to crowding as well when you are under pressure and you've got an extremely busy emergency department and you've got maybe three or four people in resus that you're trying to resuscitate and um, spending time uh, trying to understand what somebody who can't communicate as well or has difficulty communicating is is difficult to fit in with somebody who you're maybe trying to you know to, to do cardiac resuscitation on um, and it is a challenge for us in emergency, it's a challenge for all that we do, but um, we want to get better at it. And personally, I want us to improve at it and get better at trying to deal with it. I think if we have more time and we've left less crowding in our emergency departments overall, we would have time to spend that bit of extra time just trying to, trying to understand what the needs are and, and what we need to do that optimizes the patient's care and it helps them say something similar John um, I think the knowledge of staff um, and staff being trained with the appropriate knowledge and skills to, to deal with, with these groups of patients I suppose we need to also consider other pathways for, for these groups of patients if um, you know there's ways that it can be managed that maybe they don't need to come to the emergency department um, and work in partnership with our colleagues from, from those other specialty areas um, 
I think that we need to, to look at what tools we need to have available in our emergency department, and we do have communication aids that staff can use, but it's probably not enough. Um, and you know, with regards to, to sensory tools, those types of things, we're very limited in what we have available. So, you know, I think we, we recognise that there's a lot more that we can do for the, for these groups of individuals. Um, I think we have an opportunity, certainly on the Royal site, with our new um, emergency department that uh, we will be moving into in the, in the foreseeable future in the next few months. So there's an opportunity there for us to, to make changes and make adaptations that maybe would fit the needs of, of these groups of individuals. So um, I think there's certainly an opportunity there for us to improve it. Family are key in how we care for these people because they're the ones that know them best and we need to listen um, to, to what families tell us about you know, how they're appearing, if they're, they're not themselves or you know, if they're um, behaving differently from what they normally would. And we need to take our lead from the families and families need to be integral in the care in the emergency department. I don't think any of us sitting at this table want any individual to be in an overcrowded emergency department that's noisy, that's busy, because we know that that's not the right environment um, for, these, for these people. So again, it's back to the same issue. If the, the department wasn't as it is currently with, with too many people, um, we would be able to care for these patients much more as we would want. Um, turning now to Dignity and Vine, um, have you yourselves identified any concerns in relation to providing dignity to patients who would be dying in emergency care departments? And have you any suggestions on how to resolve the difficulties you would have identified? We have identified issues with dignity. We see it on a day-to-day -day basis because and I'm afraid to hark back to crowding, which so I'm afraid to hark back to crowding, which seems to be the answer to everything. But as I said, we need if you, patients need their personal space, and it's impossible to provide dignity in an overcrowded department. The staff are well aware of this, and we will go as far as we can to to provide the dignity and care that these people need. To the point we will end up moving trolleys around the department to ensure that especially when trying to convey difficult or personal news that if the relatives' rooms are full or in use, that we can at least identify a quiet and dignified personal area where you can have a sensitive chat with patients and their families. And we know full well that if patients don't feel they have privacy, you don't get the full story from them. Therefore, we are unable to treat the patients without the full information. So having <coughs> privacy for these patients is integral to their care. With regard to the dignity in dying, I mean, dignity in general is an important issue. Um, I think you're specifically asking about dignity in dying. Th there are a few issues within the emergency department. One, in terms of dignity in dying, I mean, I've been faced with a situation maybe where a, an elderly patient uh, has come into the emergency department and the family have said, well, wh why was this patient ever brought in? We wanted them to die peacefully in their, their home or in their you know, the nursing home where they were. And there certainly is a piece of work or to be done with the community to say, are we making the best decisions for patients who, uh, who are expected to die, and yet the, the default position is to come to an emergency department and die in a crowded, busy resuscitation room, which we, we have a limited amount of information about the patient very often. The family hasn't arrived up yet, and we don't know any pre-existing wishes that that patient would have wanted and so it is in those circumstances it's difficult to deliver that dignity that they had wanted or maybe specified before until we have more information and the best option may well have been for a better understanding within the community as to where that patient wanted to die and what their wishes were and that's certainly a problem that I think we do face and we maybe need you know need to look at and challenge outside of what would be the, the hospital really it's more within the community that we have to look there. Um, within the, the department itself, we certainly, anybody who's down, we afford as best dignity we can within the busy auspices of an emergency department. And if a patient 
has, for example, died in a, in a resuscitation room, very often you will have two other resuscitations going on either side. So we do try and get that patient to somewhere that's, that's quiet, that we can give them time with their family. But as a family member, the last thing you would want would be to see two other people being maybe resuscitated or looked after alongside your relative who's just died. So that within any emergency department, there are challenges to dignity and dying by the nature of the department. But certainly we do our best within what resources we have, and again, within the crowding issues that there are. Yeah. We, sorry, um, if we, if the staff feel that a patient is, is um, at you know, that, that stage that they may die in the department, they would be prioritised. Um, with our patient flow colleagues to be moved to a, a bed uh, on a ward, again to afford the patient some dignity but also to, to allow their family to be with them. Um, in the department as well, a member of the nursing staff would be assigned to liaise with the family on an ongoing basis and um, to be there with them, to give them support, to offer them chaplaincy services, just to sit and you know, hold their hands, spend time with them, you know, answer any questions that they have. Um, and again, to afford them whatever time they, they feel is required, um, and also to give them advice as you know what what happens now. You know, my mother has died, or my brother has died, and what what happens now? Because, you know, dealing with death is is part of what we do as emergency care clinicians. Um, it's a very difficult part of what we do, not only for 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 families but for the staff as well, because we do deal with some very tragic um, circumstances. Um, I suppose the other thing, you know, we recognise that there are limitations within our current department and again, this affords us an opportunity in our new department to, to have a, a specific family suite um, whereby there's two family rooms, there's a, a, a private um, viewing room for, for family to spend time with their loved one um, once they've deceased. So, you know, we've taken that into consideration in our, in our new department as well. But, that doesn't help where we are now, and I think as John says, we, we do the best that we can in very difficult circumstances, but we do try and afford people as much dignity as, as possible. It's really four, I suppose, I was cheating. Um, um, one of them is in terms of how medical staff communicate with patients and family members regarding the treatment they're about to receive or the likelihood that there's a risk to the patient's life. And the second part Dr. Maxwell has already touched on is in relation to how are medical staff involved in the trust planning for emergency care, both in terms of the structure of it, the staffing of it, the training of personnel. Looking at, I mean, communication is not only integral but vital to every time we deal with a patient and their family. The vast majority of that will come as sort of verbal face to face communication. And again, it's not always easy to do if you're trying to shimmy in next to another trolley. You've got to have the space to be able to talk frankly and openly, especially when, as you said, it's when patients are at the point where difficult decisions are being made where you're having to talk about end of life care. So we will try and be as open and transparent with the family and involve the family members wherever possible. For less serious complaints, we realize that having actual written information to convey facts is extremely important. And therefore, for a lot of the common conditions we see within the emergency department, we have written fact sheets um, and certainly having a point of contact there where if patients go home, they have concerns, they have a phone number to ring to come back to us. Um, and certainly I think it's one that the, the nurses are very good at in terms of spending or trying to spend as much time with the patient as they feel is necessary to get that information across. So nursing staff, um, all nursing staff are allocated to look after um, groups of patients within the emergency department. So there is an allocation on a, on a daily basis, on a shift by shift basis. So a member of nursing staff would be responsible for, for care needs of, of all of those patients. And that would include communication, not only with the patient, but their, their relatives or 
whoever the, the patient wants involved, um, because obviously we have to respect the, the, um, the, the patient's confidentiality as well. Um, I think, you know, if there's a risk to an individual's life, um, staff probably talk to the patient and, as I say, make them as comfortable as possible, but I would imagine that they, the severity of their condition would be conveyed more to the family as opposed to the individual themselves. Um, and again, this would be done as sensitively as, as possible, but making people aware that, you know, that the, there is a genuine risk to life. Um, with regards to planning, you know, I think that sometimes emergency care has kind of evolved over the years, and I don't know that we've had much time to, to sit down and plan ahead. Um, and I think we, we are where we are, and as I say, it's just evolved over time. I mean, certainly when I started in uh, the emergency department many years ago, there was no such thing as patients on trolleys. Um, and as I say, we haven't planned to be where we are, but I think the important thing is we plan for the future to try and uh, remedy things and make things better. Um, and as I say, with regards to the Royal site in particular, there is a new building and a new emergency department and clinical staff are involved in the planning of that. Um, so as I say, that we, we have been involved in that specific piece of work, but I think that we do need to now take the time to plan ahead and look you know, at our demographics, look to see um, potentially what our service is going to look like in the, ne the next 10, 20, 25 years, because we need to, to take the time to do that so that we are prepared, that we have the appropriately trained medical nursing staff, AHPs, whatever it is we, re re we require to deliver that service to our patients. Thank you. I suppose I really just reiterate what Nick has said about communication being a, a key element throughout any aspect of medicine, right, from medical student upward. Um, if I mean, even if you look at much many of the, the complaints that you would get in about difficulties that have happened, 60 to 70 percent of them will be about communication, and very often they can be resolved if you sit down with a family and actually explain uh, what has happened or what. Uh, or with the patient and explain, look, this is why we did this and we didn't mean to be brief or quick or we, we didn't realise we hadn't explained it enough to you or, or gone into it and very often that will resolve problems. So communication is something I think we're constantly trying to get better at, be it right from when medical students come in. I mean, I will say that to them, you know, you've got to be good at communication. Even if you're time pressured, you've got to make sure that families, patients understand what you're telling them, because very often it will be sort of a nod and you're right, I've got to go, you know, move. And it is important that we do focus on that. I think we do as best we can, but we can always get better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you all uh, very much for joining us um, today. Uh, first of all, um, serious adverse uh, incidents. Uh, you'll be familiar with this process, of course, and these can lead to um, learning letters from the board, and I'd be interested to know um, whether or not, in, in your experience, um, these are this is a helpful process, is this a practical process, um, does it assist you, does it lead to change? That's one one question. Can I, t because time is short, can I go straight to the others? Um, John, many thanks for for emphasising that that you've noticed since returning from the Antipodes, you've noticed some, some changes. Um, and of course, these changes are extremely important. And um, just a minute ago, you were emphasizing the critical importance of communication. Um, and I think that's terribly welcome. Uh, I mean, I have to say that I'm amazed, however, um, that um, that, that I think you said that it's for the, I think your words were, it's for the first time that there is this talking together in an integrated way. And, and that's brilliant. I'm glad that it's happening. But what's amazing is it's the first time. I mean, this is really astonishing. But, but thank heavens, thank heavens, there are these changes. And maybe it's a generational thing, you know. Maybe it's turning to a younger generation to, to drive a different culture. Um, I would be really interested to know 
that if any of you have a, a sort of management-related problem, not a clinical problem as such, but a management-related problem, um, where do you go with that? Where do you take that? How can you, how can you participate in effectively the, the, the running of the institution? Do you see management weekly? Um, can you phone someone up right, and, and speak to someone? I'm interested to understand, I, I don't at the moment, forgive me, but I don't. I'm interested to understand what the line of communication is from yourselves at the coalface, as it were, with management. So if you see a major management issue, something's really troubling you, something isn't working, where do you go with it? And while you just reflect on that, can I, can I say that you know, what we're interested in is, that, is this relationship between human rights and emergency care. Um, in particular, the right to the highest attainable standard of health. And in recent years, there's been a movement away from this right to health being seen as something just in the legal texts, just for lawyers. There's been a movement away from that to trying to operationalize, ugly word, I'm sorry, but trying to operationalize this right to health. How to make it real in practice, in clinics, in communities, in hospitals in emergency departments. Now, this remains work in progress. We haven't cracked it yet. And the lawyers, they can't crack it. If we leave it to the lawyers, we're all going to die prematurely. It's going to be the health professionals who are going to have to advise the human rights lawyers on what's, on what's needed. And moreover, there's evidence that taking on a human rights-based approach improves health outcomes. We're now getting some solid evidence that taking on explicitly human rights-based approach leads to health outcomes. Now, what does all this mean, this right to health stuff, mean in practice? Well, we're still finding our way. But, but one, one element of a human rights-based approach is good health governance. And one element of good health governance is participation. And one element of participation is the participation of you in management, being able to share your, your views, being able to explain where the problems uh, are, and being able to identify problems before, before people are dying prematurely. So uh, I, I would be really interested to know what processes are now being put in place, because evidently they weren't there recently. What processes, what institutions, what mechanisms are now being put in place to enable you at the coalface to really pass on your views? and to, to, to management. And in closing, can I just mention these, these quotes? Now, this is a quote from a document of last year, and it, you, you probably know it. It's called The Drive for Quality. It's about emergency uh, departments. It's from the College of Emergency Medicine. It's a UK-wide document. I should say that. It's not just Northern Ireland, UK-wide. And there's, one, one, there's lots of really stunning quotes but I'll just, just this one. Only 33% of the emergency departments reported that emergency medicine clinicians, you guys, were directly involved in decisions with their commissioning groups. Okay? Only 33% of the people who really know what's going on in these EDs is engaged in the commissioning process. I mean, I think it's extraordinary. Now, maybe that doesn't apply in Northern Ireland, okay? But this is from just uh, about a year ago, UK-wide. And the second and last quote, and then I'll shut up. Um, this is a document. Again, it's UK-wide, and it's just from a few months ago. It's called Acute and Emergency Care Prescribing the Remedy. Okay, you'll be familiar with this. And there's one passage that says this. The funding and target systems for emergency department attendances are unfit for purpose and require urgent change. This is a few months ago, UK-wide, might not apply here. I'll leave others to comment on that. So I would be really interested to know whether you're included in the commissioning process. Um, if you, when you see something going wrong, not so much clinically, I know they're related, but not so much clinically as just 
things aren't as they should be. You know, can you pick up the phone? Who do you meet? Are there weekly meetings? Because from a human rights point of view, your participation is critically important. Also the participation of the public, also participation of patients. It's not you alone, but you are a critically important voice in a human rights-based approach. So how is that being facilitated now? Thank you very much. The first one about serious incidents and how good and practical is that a tool for learning and development? And Paul, you can steer me right if I haven't picked up your questions right. Serious adverse incidents. I, sorry, I thought you were going to go through all four there again. Serious adverse, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely, good, good. Uh, serious adverse incidents. I find them essential. There's no question about it. Uh, serious adverse incidents with learning letters are essential to our practice. Uh, no less than that, they allow us to learn. Uh, they allow us to understand where problems have happened with systems, individuals, the process as a whole, um, and. They also allow us to link in with other trusts, other areas, as you say, where you have a learning letter that comes out that says, look, this, is, this has happened and be aware of it because it means we can learn without making the mistakes that others have made or other trusts or other places have made. So in short, serious adverse incidents are a fantastic way to learn, to reflect on what you've done, but also to learn without having to make similar mistakes or, or errors in your own system. The only thing I would add to that is that, as a department, what we are now trying to do is focus more on what we call SEAs or significant event audit or analysis, it's, which differs slightly. It's, in, it's a much quicker time frame. The concern with SAIs is that the process can drag out, and by the time you've got a report, people have not forgotten, but the memory is not as fresh when the report comes out as it was at the time. The SEA has a much, much tighter time frame. It's involving the people who were directly involved in the event. And it means that actually we can get the learning points out to our staff and to educate them in a much quicker time frame. It becomes almost, not more relevant, but people are more focused because it's happened in the immediate past rather than six months down the line. So we feel that's something that hopefully should or increase the learning that we are getting from these unfortunate events. The only other thing I would add to that is that um, I suppose the challenge for us as clinicians is getting the, the learning down to the to the coal face with the staff. Um, and you know we, we have a large number of doctors and nurses to try and disseminate that to and making sure that you know that, that that's what happens. So we've introduced a system of um, daily safety briefings, well twice daily safety briefings so that the key learning from the like of SAIs are, are shared with staff um, and repeat it and repeat it if necessary so that staff you know, know what to do differently so that these incidents hopefully won't happen again. I mean, that's the whole point of SAIs, to try and prevent similar things happening again in the future. Where do you take management-related problems? you can spot them on the shop floor, so to speak, how, do you, how does that work in practice? Well, currently, I suppose, as clinical director, the guys come to me if there's a specific uh, management-related thing. Um, as I said before, I'm clinical director for Royal and Matter, so things would come to a degree through me. I like to think that I'm available to everyone. Uh, as best I, as best I can be. So, for example, I'm on the floor. I was on the floor this morning. I'd be back there this afternoon again uh, to check up. Um, uh, in terms of my interaction with other managers and my co-directors and directors, um, again, at the, at, the, at the moment, I find it refreshingly, refreshingly good that interaction. For example, later today, uh, I'd be meeting with other clinical directors and co-directors to discuss uh, as part of our task force and moving forward how we move forward and the different problems. I had a meeting this morning with an associate medical director and another co-director about uh, orthopedic services and issues. So um, any problems that there are, for example, with crowding in the emergency department, I like to be aware of it. And I know that the managers above me seem to also be aware of it as well because we're communicating about it regularly. Um, and certainly, uh, since my return, as you, as you say, from uh, from Australia, I uh, I have found refreshingly uh, open and, and, and frank discussions about 
the managerial problems with an emergency department. And I like to think that we do have access. I don't know, Nick, do you want to say? What, what do you I'm purely going to echo John's remarks. I think the difference is we are on first name terms with our management colleagues. We are in a position where we can have open and frank discussions about issues that directly impact upon clinical care. And certainly they're very visible. So this morning our co-director was down in the department really to see how things were going to keep us informed as to the state of beds, what was being in place to try and move patients out of the department. They're visible and it's it's much more a horizontal tier. There's the vertical nature of management being seen as a, a separate species is probably the wrong word, but as being different to the clinicians, there's much more integration now between clinicians and management, which I think can only be a good thing. Mm -hmm. A recent report that um, Paul quoted, which was that um, the conclusion from a number of the, the Royal Colleges was that the targets weren't fit for purpose, and I wonder whether you feel that's a, a reasonable recommendation or you would demure from that? And I'm thinking of four hour, 12 hour, but the broader targets and as, as a whole. Uh... As clinicians, individually I'm not a huge fan of targets. Targets are there for targets and you can manipulate targets and you can end up in a terrible situation, for example, like Mid Staffordshire or somewhere like that, where targets are the override patient care and quality care. So as clinicians, we like to think we focus on the quality of care and how the patients are cared for, not how do we achieve this particular target so that we can tick a box and the health minister smiling because this is done. Uh, it has to be about more than that for us. Targets have their use and have their purpose in that we can we can measure and we can say, yes, this is unacceptable, this particular target. And, and you can choose any target. New Zealand, for example, chooses a six-hour target, which I personally think is a much more sensible target because it allows maybe a greater time for communication and for reflection with your patient and allows you to get things better structured for them. Um, but that, that's a personal opinion. But targets uh, are there. They're created by governments to achieve. They do help us in some ways to get past a certain point. But I think as clinicians, our focus always has to be the patient and what is best for the patient. And if it's best for me treating a patient into, into five hours because that's what the patient needs and that's what the patient take, takes care of, I'm not, you know, needs or wants, I'm not going to put them somewhere else just because a watch says I have to get you out by four hours. I don't know how the rest of you feel, but that's that's my take on it. Well, I think the, the time element is one, one bit of um, the, the um, care that we need to deliver. And we need to be mindful as to how long patients are in our department because, I mean, there's high evidence to show that the longer patients remain in ED, the higher morbidity and mortality rates. So we do need to be mindful of, of how long patients are there. But as John says, the motivation can't be the clock. It has to be doing the right thing for the patient and getting them where they need to be. To, If they need to be longer with us to, to get their emergency care, then so be it. Um, but then we need to ensure that they get to their definitive care um, in a timely manner, but again, which is appropriate for that individual. And again, we, we are reliant on our colleagues to help us to do this. <coughs> Wait. Agreement, it would be that the patient has to come first. The targets can be used as a driver for change, which we appreciate having you know, a set of indices that we can be measured against, but it has to be the individual patient at the end of the day comes above the target. And as John said, as clinicians, I would feel far happier accepting that a patient has been in the department five hours and yet receive the care they need and require than moving them out to meet a target of four hours and for them to have substandard care. Have you ever felt under either implicit as opposed to, or explicit pressure to meet those targets? You're obviously aware of them. Or, or in, do they hover in the background, or is there? I mean, what's the relationship between that kind of knowledge of, of there are targets, etc., and what you're on a day-to-day -day basis delivering? How does that interaction work in practice? I've only been in 
itself for us for the last 18 months. In England, the four-hour target culture is, I think there is more it's seen as a trust issue and it is more, it's more rigorously policed. Whether that is beneficial or not remains to be seen, but I, having been in my 18 months in Belfast, I haven't had pressure from management to say this patient must be moved to the detriment of their care. I think that is the general impression of, I haven't worked in, in England, but I think that seems to be the general impression of any doctors we get over from England, where there is an, there is an intense pressure in the, in the rest of the UK uh, to drive this target, and it's all about a target-driven culture. Whereas here, certainly I haven't felt any pressure with somebody coming down and saying you're four hours, four hours, four hours, four hours and certainly, yeah. I mean, I think that the biggest pressure for staff and AD is back to the crowding. I know we sound like we're being very repetitive here, but that's the thing that causes staff the, the, the greatest pressure. Um, seeing patients lying on trolleys 10, 11, 12 hours, that's the thing that causes them the greatest anxiety. And that's where the, the, the pressure comes, um, patients being where they shouldn't be for far too long. Do you want to come back on any of that? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Thanks very much for all, all these comments. I really appreciate it. And, I, and I, I, in my following remarks, you know, I don't want they, them to disguise the fact that you're talking about significant improvements, and this is fantastic. John, are you involved in commissioning? For the funding issues and the, the commissioning and things you mentioned, you're, you're absolutely right, because I would make a point, and this is probably my personal opinion regarding funding. We do have a, a top-down funding system here, whereas, uh, again, I hate to hark on to it, but in Australia they have a different model in that they've gone for an activity-based funding model where money does follow the patient. So when you come into your emergency department, the funding is per patient, and you go in and the emergency department actually gets money for each patient that arrives. And then as you go up through the system for each for an illness or whatever condition you have, you will get X amount of money for that with additional conditions, more complex conditions. It's weighted again into that. And so the, there's a big difference in processing in my mind in that it, a top-down funding that says, here's a block fund, you get this chunk based on historical type ideas and not specifically to say this patient gets this money and it follows them through. So it's a top-down sort of funding as opposed to an activity or a patient-based funding system where the, pa the, the money comes through with the patient and essentially the money and the funding belongs to the patient and as they travel through your system, the money goes with them. I, and I have to say I'm, I'm much, I prefer that system as opposed to our system, which I don't think is geared towards the benefit of the of, of patient care, but that, I mean that's a not a Belfast Trust view. That's an individual view, and it's pr th there will be arguments and controversy, you know, around uh, that opinion. So presently, you're not included in the commissioning process. Yeah. Wouldn't not. I haven't specifically commissioned anything. Like, no. Um, may I ask? Uh, so I understand the hierarchy. Who's your boss? Who's my my boss would be um, director of uh, unscheduled care. Bernie owns. Uh, and so I have a co-director I work closely with as well. Okay. So do you have weekly meetings? Um, yes. How, how is it, you see, listening to the arrangements you yes. described, it all sounded a bit chummy. And okay. that's great. And what I'm trying to understand is whether or not there are sort of formal mechanisms. Because sometimes there might be really difficult issues to raise, right? So do, is there a, as part of health governance, you know, is there a... I don't want anything too bureaucratic, but I'm trying to understand whether or not there's some, some mechanism where you know that next week or next month you're going to be meeting with your line manager when you can raise various things. As I said, this afternoon we've got a meeting. So, you know, there, 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 are, lot, there, are, there are no question about it, formal meetings. Uh, it, you know, it, it, I did, didn't mean to sound chummy, but it is probably because we have a good working relationship uh, with people at the moment, which is excellent. But, um, uh, for example, the, the impact sort of task force here you, that we've described now, and th those are definitely going to be formal meetings. There's formal meetings this afternoon that I'll attend after this. 
And it, it was a formal meeting this morning when I met with an associate medical director and a co-director in orthopaedics. I mean, it, it's not just we get together and, and have a coffee in a, in a shop. Those, these are formal timetabled meetings that have been in my diary for a month. We have regular management meetings within each department. So, for example, the matter I'll go to at half eight on a, on a Monday, and then the Royals meeting will be on a, on a Wednesday, and co-directors will be at that. That I communicate with and oh, there's a f there are formalised processes definitely. And thank you for that clarification. And if say there's a locum in your department, and she has encountering some difficulty, um, do you have a, is there a sort of a weekly team meeting? Or I don't know what you're going to call it, but is there a weekly meeting when she might be able to raise some some ma management related issue, or is it a question of bumping into her on the on the ED? definitely have weekly meetings. The problem, as you describe with a locum, is a locum might only be there for a day or two days. Lo locums, by their nature, are they're, they're, they're free to hire doctors. Now, if it is a long-term locum where we've contracted them for, say, several months, then, yes, they will be part of our team that we will be able to work with. But you're right in saying that if, if somebody comes along and works, fills a, one shift in the day for us that we have difficulty filling, then you know, it, it is very difficult to know what they're going to say a week later, and if they're only turning up for a day, if there's a problem, then I can get them. Someone who is, who is, who is, uh, t for whom you are the manager, is there some mechanism, not a formal thing, but just not a question of bumping into them in the cafeteria, is there some way where they can say, you know, John, um, what happened last week was a real problem with this, that, or the other. Is there some arrangement whereby that can happen, or is it a question of bumping into them on the ED? No, no. We, we'll always. I mean, we have we have formal board rounds every day, so we, you know, communicate, you know, problems on a daily basis. We'll have handovers in the morning, handovers in the evenings, formal board rounds. There's senior vetting uh, on 99% of our, you know. We, we achieve a senior vetting, so there's a, it's vetted by a senior doctor, uh, patients admitted. So we have formal mechanisms where if there's a problem, these you know, people can go and, and go to you about them. Um, you're, again, I would reiterate, regular locums that come in, it is much easier because they'll attend our meetings and be there for our meetings and get feedback like that. If somebody is there for one day, within that one day, they would be fully supported and be able to go to any of the consultants. We have specific consultants timetabled for specific slots in the day so there's all you know up until what 12 one o'clock at night there will be a consultant on the floor that can be you know you can broach any issues with and well I mean for example the, the docs can do a reflective summary of what has happened and maybe go to the consultant that was on that night and they might pass it on to me if there's an issue or concern so they're definitely both they're both informal and formal processes which I think there should be um, and certainly with long-term locums, we can facilitate the more formal ones with the person who's there for the day, for that day, we, we certainly give them support. Okay, so to, to close, and I've spoken mm. for too long, but, but thank you very much. I, I just want to sort of underscore that this human rights stuff is actually sort of designed to ensure that you have the space to, to fulfill your heavy responsibilities in a professional way. And that, that requires processes by which you can speak to management and those below you can speak to you and so you know your participation in the governance of your institution is critically important and we ha I have the impression that you know if as you said for the first time people are now speaking in a new way you know those governance arrangements have not been working so hence my questions and thank you very much for the clarification and and I hope that you can see human rights as an assistant as an asset and an ally for you as you try to open up the governance of your institution. Thank you very much. I have one very quick final question. There are very quick answer. And overcrowding has been a, an issue you've, all, all three of you have emphasized. The move of the RVH to a new emergency department in January 2015, do you think that will end the problem of overcrowding, um, make it better, or are you confident that that issue will be tackled by moving the RVH's emergency department or not? I think that the overcrowding issue isn't going to be improved by moving to a new environment. Um, it's a, dif a different building, um, albeit a, a much nicer building than what we're being accommodated in at the minute. Um, 
the issues about overcrowding have to be addressed by our inpatient colleagues, by our GP colleagues, by our community colleagues, and ourselves all working together. Um, certainly, you know, moving to the new department will, will be a much um, more modern environment, um, although that in itself will, will present challenges to us um, because of the, the internal layout. However, as I say, that's only one part of it. The, the um, system, getting the system right, will, will, will prevent the overcrowding and reduce the overcrowding, not moving to a new building. New building doesn't solve it. You can move wherever you want, but you have to get your flows and your systems right, no matter where you are. OK, thank you very much. Um, we've taken you over, um, over our time. Um, if there's anything which we've discussed today or anything we've missed that you want to provide us with a written submission, we're more than happy to, to take that. And thank you again for, for your evidence um, this afternoon. Um, it's been very welcome and it's very useful for us to get both a sense of what's happening from those who are providing services as well as those who are planning um, and managing them. So thanks, thanks again. Thank you.